Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray in Beijing. Buddhism came to China from India during the Han Dynasty nearly 2,000 years ago, and is one of the most important religions in China. It has a profound influence on traditional Chinese culture and thought. And yet, in the rapidly transforming <coughs> world, there are still many misconceptions about the religion. To get a better understanding of Buddhism and its development in China and abroad, we are very honored to be joined in the studio by Venerable Shi Minghai, Vice President of the Buddhist Association of China, and Professor Wu Jiang from the University of Arizona. They are here in Beijing to attend the International Seminar on Chinese Buddhist Culture of Ancestral Monasteries. Before we get started, let's take a look at this. Buddhism first reached China from India roughly 2,000 years ago during the Han Dynasty, spreading through Central Asia along the Silk Road. And the establishment of the White Horse Temple signifies the first time Buddhism doctrines were brought to China. Han Dynasty China was deeply Confucian, and Confucianism is focused on ethics and maintaining harmony and social order in society. Buddhism, on the other hand, emphasized entering the monastic life to seek a reality beyond reality. But by the second century AD, aided to some extent by the simplicity of its approach and some similarities with Taoism, it managed to gain a firm foothold and acquired a sizable following. Buddhism got stronger and stronger in China, which soon claimed the largest population of Buddhists, surpassing India. In the 6th century AD, Chinese people developed Chan Buddhism, also known as Zen Buddhism. Zen philosophy emphasizes meditation and experience over words and explanation. Among the most important figures of Chan Buddhism is the 6th patriarch, Hui Nang, to whom the Platform Sutra of the 6th patriarch is attributed. Three different forms of Buddhism evolved in China as it reached the centers of population at varying times and by different routes. Eventually, they became known as Han, Tibetan, and Southern Buddhism. It is estimated that China has more than 200 million Buddhism followers. Welcome to Dialogue. Why is the culture of ancestral monasteries so important for Chinese Buddhism? Um, <clears throat> it is believed that uh, the Buddhism first came to China the year of second before Christ. And uh, it took a long time for Chinese people to study the Buddhism from India and digest, do researching. Uh, and, uh, in Tang Dynasty, uh, Chinese people has has completed uh, this task. That means to to understand the essence of Buddha's teaching, and then uh, there appeared uh, many Chinese style schools of Buddhism. Mm. So uh, this long process. Uh, for the scholars, scholars usually understand this long process from two views. Uh, one is the Buddhism from India try to suit suit the situation of China, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the other is by the efforts of many Chinese patriarchs. Um, uh, Buddhism from India try to find its new form in the new land then it became it became the the compilation of chinese tradition culture and uh, uh, deeply enter the chinese culture widely uh, influenced benefit the chinese people but do you sometimes feel it's necessary to seek more inspirations from hometown of sakyamuni uh, by taking a pilgrimage to the West, quote unquote, because we have a very famous classical novel called the mm. Ji. In English, it's called the Pilgrimage to the West. Do you do such? <coughs> do you undertake, undertake such a long journey? 
Yeah, in 2015, uh, yeah, I have been to India uh, and visited uh, uh, the Bodhikaya, Bodhikaya and uh, some other uh, places which uh, are collected with Buddhas. Uh, his the place he 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 was born, and uh, he he entered the nirvana, uh, the place he entered the nirvana and so on. Yeah. But do you think the culture of uh, ancestral monasteries uh, regarding Chinese Buddhism could be accepted by your Indian friends and uh, practitioners from India? Uh, for the Buddhism, there is a miracle. There is a miracle that after it depart departed India, uh, it uh, went to many places uh, and suit with the culture situation, uh, the environment of the country, and, um, but all these uh, schools of Buddhism have the same essence. Uh, so though they, are be they belong to different schools, but the disciples of the schools, they recognize each other. Uh, and yes, that is very good. That would not cause any uh, clashes between different branches and uh, schools uh, which actually believe in the same uh, Sakya harmony. But why do you think the culture of ancestral monasteries uh, is unique and important for Chinese Buddhism? So absolutely, this is very important. We can think about the ancestral monastery is a sacred place from the past. And we are Chinese and we have the tradition of ancestor worship. So what ancestor represent is our past. And uh, from India, we transplant the Buddhism in China and we brought back the Buddhist canon, translate all those into Chinese. So that can, we can claim that ancestor monastery actually represent the best of the Chinese uh, Buddhism. Fundamentally, do you think there are very basic similarities between Christianity and Buddhism? For example, in Buddhism, we have the word of Nirvana, mm. and in Christianity, we have the paradise. Now, everyone who practices either Christianity or Buddhism, of course, want to cherish the dream of uh, reaching Nirvana. And in the case of uh, Christianity in the Western culture, they want to be in the part of paradise. You want to be there beyond the secular world. First of all, your take. Master Ming Hai. Oh, um, uh, Buddha's teaching, we understand Buddha's teaching, uh, it consists of uh, five, uh, we call five vehicles. Five vehicles. Um, so, during the five vehicles, uh, two of them uh, we understand the Christianity belong to two of them, uh, the two based uh, for the for the human being and the heaven. So these two vehicles, uh, Christianity be belong to these two vehicles, and but we we we, we think uh, there's something transcending transcending these two vehicles, that the absolute that absolute uh, liberation of our life uh, uh, from the chain of uh, re uh, reincarnation, yeah, from the chain of reincarnation. Reincarnation. Yeah, reincarnation. So, <clears throat> and till, and then the full enlightenment, we call the Buddha, uh, uh, the Lord Buddha's uh, experience, uh, the full enlightenment. So, um, of course, the values of Christianity Though uh, it stand, it stop at the level of heaven, but we think it also belong, uh, belongs to, to to some 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 virtues, some virtues. Uh, uh, so it's valuable. And do you think that uh, Buddhism, and particularly Chinese Buddhism, is able to transcend <coughs> the two layers of Christianity? Uh, I think transcendence is a very important concept in religion. So every religion has its own way of to being uh, transcendent. But however, I think Christianity and the Buddhism, there's uh, some fundamental difference. As uh, Master mm -hmm. Ning has said, uh, Buddha is fundamentally an enlightened being. Right? He's a human being and become enlightened and become the Buddha Lord. So this is fundamentally different from the Christianity, which God is uh, completely the other.
it's transcendental. I don't know, starting from which dynasty in Chinese history, um, a master uh, started to call for the practice of Buddhism, not necessarily in the monasteries or temples, but you can do that mm. in your own home. Mm. Wherever you, you live, you work, you can practice mm. the teachings and do the meditation <coughs> yourself without having to go to the local temple. Is mm. that true? Is that still the case in the present day China? Mm, yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, this teaching was from the Sixth Patriarch's uh, Sutra. Considering this issue, we, we return to the ancestor monasteries yeah, during the long process of uh, but, uh, the history of Buddhism. Uh, there have been many Chinese patriarchs who, who made the great efforts to, to try to bring the Buddhism to the society, uh, to the daily life. So for the sixth patriarch, sixth patriarch, uh, we call Huinan, Huinan Master. Yeah. So in his teaching, he emphasized that we can practice in our daily life. Uh, uh, Buddha's teaching. Um, you can stay. Uh, 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 you can you you can live a worldly life, uh, uh, but at the same time you practice the teaching of Buddha. Uh. Hui Neng is long been known for his poem. Ben Wu Pu Ti Shu He Tu Ran Chen Ai. I mean, this is so often quoted by not just the believers of Buddhism, but those who are familiar with Chinese history. <coughs> I'd like to have your translation. Well, it's uh, originally there's no tree of the Bodhi, <coughs> but where the dust collected. Deep and right? yeah. So, uh, yeah. what's the deep message that uh, Hui Neng wants to deliver? Um, think about his poem, we should return the former poem written by another master mm -hmm. uh, before him. Uh, Shen Xiu. Uh, our body is Bodhi tree, and um, our mind is like a mirror. Uh, we we should do cleaning every day to to keep it uh, out of that. Uh, so this in this poem, um, it tells about practice, but. Mm, that's not the final attainment of enlightenment. Uh, but for Huinan, uh, in his poem, he has arrived at the final enlightenment. So mm, in his experience, there is no uh, conflict. Conflict. Uh, conflict. Uh, so no poetry, no mirror and uh, unnecessary to do cleaning and uh, no difference between the dead and uh, uh, the cleaning. Uh, Wu Jiang, yes. according to some masters and scholars in the monastic communities, we are now in the so-called decline age of Buddhism mm -hmm. because people's root in Buddhism is rather shallow. What's your perception of the decline age of Buddhism? Well, so this, uh, sometimes we call this a latter-day Dharma. So because uh, correct teaching and the correct p practice are no longer there. So we're in the degenerated age that we need new kind of Buddhism. And so we have a Chan Buddhism, for example, pure land uh, worship, all this. And right now we're in the 21st century and facing all these <coughs> dilemmas, different problems. So definitely I think we need to be more creative to have a new kind of Buddhism and especially the Chinese kind of Buddhism and to spread Buddhist teaching. Thank you very much. You are watching dialogue with uh, yeah. Venerable Shi Minghai, Vice President of the Buddhist Association of China, and Professor Wu Jiang from University of Arizona, the United States. We'll be back. Please stay with us. Welcome back. <coughs> These days, obviously, there is the rise of uh, living standards across China, and with the pockets getting deeper and deeper, we see more of a uh, disillusionment with the uh, material life, the secular life, and it seems uh, <coughs> we have more believers of Christianity, Islamism, and particularly Buddhism in Beijing and other major cities. Uh, I mean, I was a little surprised, uh, not because of their faith, but because it seems their choice of faith actually comes from uh, 
a kind of disappointment with the secular life. Can you explain to us your understanding about the reasons behind their choice of a faith? Um, in 1996, uh, a research uh, was done in British. All the they do a research that all the believe, believers of the religion, the number, the number of the all the believers of the religion, uh, was at the time was 80, 80 percent of the population, the total population of the of the earth, and uh, in two thousand eleven, the Pew Research Center. They did a research, uh, a calculating that now the number of the believers of all religion um, is eighty four percent. Eighty four. Yeah, eighty four percent. No, all of the all of the world. Mm -hmm. Eighty four percent. Uh, so originally. Someone thought, um, because of the sign, because because of the progress of science, uh, the belief of religion will become less and less. But on the contrary, it didn't happen. Mm. Very quickly, yeah. uh, Professor Wu Jiang, what do you think of the relationship, if any, between science and religion? Well, this is a very big question. And uh, it Albert has Einstein been there for a long time. He's a believer of sanity, exactly. but he's a scientist. Yes, yes. And uh, the question can be understood uh, in many different kind of ways. First, if uh, science actually can prove the existence of God, so you can use scientific method to do the research. On the other hand, you can actually compare science and the religion, because religious teaching, especially Buddhism, is very rational. So there's scientific element in the teaching itself. And that, that's very interesting, actually, in the West, 100 years ago, when people first learned about Buddhism, everybody thought it's science. If you look at the Four Noble Truths, there's no <laughs> God. It's no God there, but mm. rather it's pure reasoning mm -hmm. of causality. So this proves, actually, Buddhism probably has a more kind of connection with science. And even today, scientists mm. are the people who are interested in religion and mm. interested in Buddhism in particular, especially mm. in the so-called contemplative science. So I think there's a lot of things we can talk about, Buddhism and the science, and also do some kind of research in this area. Right. Mm. Yeah. Today we are in an age of a pluralism, uh, with the different values coming into China, to see nothing of the deep-rooted Chinese culture uh, that can easily appeal to the mind and the heart of uh, different generations of, of the Chinese consumers today. Having said this, uh, um, we've been talking about why in East Asia there's been the boom of economic development and prosperity. First of all, starting with the four little industrial dragons and then China being in the forefront for yet another long period of economic prosperity. Then, naturally, those who follow this process and who are skeptical about, the China, about Chinese culture would say, look, can we build any relationship? Can we figure out any relationship between their faith and economic development? I've been thinking about this very hard for a long time. I'd like to have your perception. Mm, yeah, a very good question. Maybe. Uh, even for the Buddhists, we should uh, think about it. Um, oh, you should, you should not think about it because you have to keep a distance from secular life and consumerism. You would rather focus on meditation. Do you think this counterrally should also hold water? Yeah, uh, and uh, the, uh, in nineteenth century, yeah, in nineteenth century. Um, in German, there is a Max Weber. Yeah, um, he he made he found uh, uh, some connection uh, between the economical progress and the the values, uh, the morality of Christianity. 
Yeah. It should be the Xinjiang Lunli, the Ethics yeah. 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 of Protestant and uh, economic uh, spirit of capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> so now I think the same thing appear uh, for, for, for uh, the same challenge uh, appear from for the Buddhists that we should try to uh, find that positive, uh, that positive spirit in Buddha's teaching, which is which is good for the both for the economic progress and our spiritual uh, practice. So, so that's what uh, that's what we we, we should. So I agree completely. As uh, Master Ming had mentioned, the spiritual life, and this is exactly Buddhism is good about. Because we look at this world, I think there's two major problems into this world for human beings. After all those material progress and the wealth we have accumulated, one is uh, alienation. We actually feel alienated from things we created, which is the material culture, the civilization. Another problem is fragmentation. Nowadays, we all use a cell phone, a smartphone, and uh, those uh, machines actually take away all time and also take away part of ourselves. And this problem created need for a new spiritual life and a new way of finding the authentic self. So I think in this way, Buddhism can fit in pretty nicely because Buddhist teaching, if I translate what, what it's about, is about the mind, basically. It's not about material culture. The material culture can't solve anything. It's all about your mind. And the second, Buddhist offers very sophisticated thinking. It's not just the black and the white. You have to consider all different aspects together. So it's a very sophisticated teaching. And the third principle in Buddhism is about engage. You have to engage your life, engage your family, friends, and the whole society. So put all this together, I think Buddhism is very promising in today's world. Um, I agree with uh, uh, his opinion that uh, I add something that uh, that last century, there have been many Chinese great monks uh, uh, try to to find uh, those positive teaching from Buddha, which maybe we have forgotten. So then uh, we call uh, the engaged Buddhism, engaged Buddhism, Ren Jian Fo Jiao. So this engaged Buddhism, I think, uh, can support uh, support the, the wisdom uh, in the situation which the economic uh, uh, people need uh, uh, economic progress and then the wisdom in spirit life. Mm. Now some people say compared to Christianity and Islam, Buddhism is more of a philosophy or a way of a living than a religion. <laughs> I would like to have your <laughs> comment. Uh, Professor. <laughs> right. it, it is very hard to say. If you want to compare uh, which one is better, maybe the way of living is uh, more compatible with contemporary life. But however, uh, Buddhism is different because it is uh, inclusive. So we have to describe Buddhism in this way, it's not exclusive, which means a lot of different kind of element can find their place in the Buddhism philosophical system. And I already mentioned that Buddhism is a very sophisticated system, so that means it's not a black and a white. So there could be different gods, but they all coexist harmoniously. I'm afraid the spread and development of whatever religions largely depend on preaching, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, Christian priests have been pretty active, even yeah. at the risk of their lives, in the most dangerous places. They would go there to undertake adventures so that they could hammer home the message from God and the Gospels, such sort of stuff. Now, what about the Buddhism? Uh, I was told a few years back by Professor Wang Gengwu uh, in the univer National University of Singapore that in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, the spread of Buddhism is not as uh, pervasive as other major religions such as Christianity. Wang, Wang Gengwu is a very respected uh, Chinese historian in the field, so I read his book and admire his scholarship. I think probably he's telling the truth, yes, probably Buddhism is not as missionary as the other traditions. And uh, the new studies in South China, for example, found Buddhism is very much associated with the family lineage organization. So when people migrated to Southeast Asia, so they brought Buddhism with them together. So you can see Buddhism religions very closely associated with Chinese immigration process. 
in, in to, to, to a large extent is probably an immigrant religion. So in the future, I think uh, Buddhism has a lot of room to develop their mission, uh, missionary strategies. And therefore, do you think the rise of internet and the pervasive use yeah, of the mobile phones will help us spread uh, religions and uh, religious teachings more quickly than before? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> do you use uh, <laughs> smartphones yourself? Uh, yeah, I, of course I use. And in our temple, we also have a website. Uh, uh, so right, we we right. We, uh, uh, we use the website to ex to promotion to promote uh, the Buddha's teaching, uh, but on the contrary, um, the website the internet uh, we bring many problems for the uh, for the people nowadays. So um, during in recent time, I, I very often met with people who asked me. Uh, master, it seems very difficult for me to to be quiet. Uh, so, so this is a challenge. So, yeah. so I tell I tell them uh, to be careful to use the the tools of the internet, and to be careful <laughs> to to get too much information from the internet. Uh, yeah. uh, so I will, I will add to this, because Buddhism is really a technology-friendly religion, I would say. Mm -hmm. Because you can think about the invention of printing, for example. It's because of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism in China, for the sake of spreading Buddhist teaching, and he invented the printing technology, right, back to, back to the ninth century. And even right now, the invention of the smartphone, internet, that's a great kind of a tool for spreading Buddhism. And the Buddhism, I think, is very much advanced in this respect. For example, Buddhist canon. Not only it has been digitized, and a lot of the digital tools has been used to analyze the ancient scriptures. So there are a lot of things we can do to advance Buddhism through technology innovations. And Google, you know, the Google CEOs and a lot of the technical kind of the, uh, engineers, they love Buddhism so much. So meditation courses has been offered in Google. So can, can you imagine other religions or other traditions being kind of accepted so readily by the engineers and technicians. By the end of the discussion here, I believe that many of our viewers would feel quite relieved that there won't necessarily be any conflicts between science and uh, <laughs> uh, Buddhism. culture of uh, ancestral monasteries uh, regarding Chinese Buddhism. Uh, in fact, many scientists are monks themselves. Yeah. With that, we come to the end of this very enlightening discussion with uh, Venerable Shi Minghai and Professor Wu Jiang from State University of Arizona. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.